Eco, it's just a man here. As I was planning a trip to examine a pair of very intriguing pyramidal mounds uh, deep in the Seven area, I stumbled upon an unrelated, nonetheless staggering piece of information which stretched my worldviews to the point of, uh, of no return. At the foot of the aforementioned mounds lies a vast megalithic complex known as the Cham des Bondons, which consists of some 154 meniers scattered over a 10 kilometer square area, which makes the site the largest menier concentration in southern France. My initial intention was to figure out whether the meniers and the pyramids were uh, related in any way. A few months prior in Algarve, Portugal, hadn't I come upon small meniers adorned with snake figures topping a series of triangular-faced red earth mounds. You see, pyramid-shaped mounds are a subject of fascination to me. Their exploration has led me to mind-boggling related discoveries, such as magnificent geoglyphs, which I'll cover in an upcoming episode, etc. But in this case, the relation to pyramids was mere serendipity, or at least does it seem that way until, who knows, an unsuspected correlation uh, with what follows emerges. As I was perusing Google Earth in search of an itinerary for my day's hike between Meniers and Pyramids, an unexpected observation aroused my curiosity. The Bondon area was once home to a uranium quarry. Then, inadvertently uh, wandering some 20 kilometers astray, I spotted a second one at a place whose name is evocative of the presence of Meniers, les pierres plantées, the planted stones. So. I got to wondering if there happened to be any kind of link between uranium and meteors. I punched both terms in my go on and sure enough, there it was, a 1977 book titled Megalith et routes secrètes de l'uranium, Megalith and the Secret Roots to Uranium, by a French author by the name of Marc Den. So today I wanted to find out if the many alignment would lead me to uh, the uranium quarry. So I took the hike and I'm taking you with me. Mark Dem, by his pen name, who died in 97, was a Belgian-born French author of crime novels. He was also a megalith buff. Even though his book was published by a major French publisher, Albin Michel and must have made quite the splash in some circles back in the day, uh, Dem's theory seems to have fallen into oblivion. For some reason, the story of the book is redolent for me of that of uh, the water-propelled car. <laughs> the subjects of Megalith is one that archaeologists have been puzzling over at great length for eons. The topic was all the rage among them in the early 1900s. To their discharge, uranium wasn't sought after until the 1950s. The first French uranium mine opened in 1948, so <clears throat> they didn't have much to go on at all. But, as it turns out, groundbreaking discoveries really is no more to them than a fly in their, in their ointment. <laughs> Although Dem has nailed it big time, our articles keep flourishing about the enduring meniers and Dolman's uh, so-called head-scratcher. Nothing but taxpayer money-funded wrong tree barking and, uh, and dead horse flogging, in my view. Dam's theory is of similar magnitude as that of Chris Dunn's, the author of uh, the classic book, The Giza Power Plant, in a sense that it settles the matter with regards to many years and dolmens, just as conclusively as Dunn's work does in the case of, uh, of the pyramids. Dam spent a lot of time tracking megalith boots on the ground. <coughs> He uh, located them, he uh, measured them, he uh, recorded their orientations and their uh, position relative to one another. He wrote about them in several publications. Academia's claims with uh, respect to Megalith never checked out with them. 
he was aware at an early stage of uh, what dolmens and menhirs were not. Prior to even mentioning their real function, the first 10 chapters of his book are dedicated to deconstructing the wobbly official narrative stone by stone. Just like Egyptologists flushed out the absence of corpses in the pyramid by ascribing it to pillage, paleontologists used a bric-a-brac of pseudo-scientific arguments to explain away the absence of skeletons in the vast majority of dolmens, the dissolving power of rainwater in yet watertight environments, <clears throat> the alleged acidity of the Britain soil, a staggering 7, 7 pH, i.e. neutral, and even the presence of wood, the decay of which was purported to generate enough acidity to entail the utter disappearance of the human remains. Laughable. <laughs> as for the many years, one can read astounding declarations such as that they were substitutions to dolmens, inside of which the soul of the demise was supposed to be enclosed. Pure genius. So, if megalith can't contain a corpse, then it must contain its soul. Most of the poultry finds the search for human re remains in dolmens did yield were dated to all periods of history. Uh, cons consisted in fragments by the helter skelter together with uh, other detritus such as pottery shards and whatnot, which pointed to the repurposing of dolmens as mere dumpsters. Moreover, the lore regards dolmens as the homes of fairies, dwarves, jinns, saracens, and what have you, but never does it mention sepultures. If the population of the time had found human remains in them, wouldn't that have been enough to snuff out such beliefs among them as them rightly contends? Finally, can you conceive of a tomb with an ingress or without at least a door to block it? None of them were ever closed in any way. However, the veil of mystery shrouding the functions of the dolmens actually served and endured until one day a mysterious package turned up in Dem's mailbox. Qu'est-ce que c'est Hey carrière d'Uranium, s'il vous plaît Première à gauche, deuxième à droite, et puis tout droit Merci The parcel contained an intriguing manuscript authored by the sender himself. It had first been sent to the HQ of a magazine Dem had published an article on Stone Engine. Pierre Georgelin, a gunsmith out of Brest, Brittany, had for years and on spent most of his spare time tracking down Megalith through Brittany, covering hundreds of miles on foot. His manuscript was actually twofold. The first part, dated to 1968, was titled Thoughts on Breton Megalith, and the second one from 1971, Britain, Meniers, and Tumuli. What was to be taken away from it was that Meniers, Tumuli, and Dolmens were aligned like the links of a chain, the former acting as mere road signs with directional inscriptions and all, the latter as shelters for the travelers along the way. This theory was incontrovertibly proven by Georges Jolin's cogent reasoning, and Dem was able to verify the facts it was propped on himself. Like, for instance, that from the position of any menhir or dolmen, another megalith was always in sight. At least at the time, because many megalith have since been destroyed, while some of them are now overgrown, etc. Dan believes that those megaliths date back to an ice age when no vegetation blocked the view. Another mind-blowing illustration of the accuracy of Georges theory is the story of the Lufong octopus, or octopi to be exact, since around 30 occurrences of that pattern can be found etched in granite at various locations in Brittany. Indeed, resembling an octopus or a, va a vagina to some noty archaeologist, it was ascribed to an alleged maritime tribe of the shores of Brittany. However, gazing at camps that were deemed of Roman origins, situated in the vicinity of the alleged crustaceans, reveals a pattern very eerily similar to uh, the many engravings. Chalgena made a copy of one of them and showed it around to uh, riparians, which repeatedly uh, triggered the same reaction. It's a map of the camp, and indeed, the comparison is compelling. As to the antiquity of the dolmens, <clears throat> the oldest skeleton found in one of them 
in Dordogne was carbon dated to 10,000 years. But first off, dendrochronology has shown that the more remote the carbon dated antiquity, the more underestimated the assessment must be deemed because carbon 14 absorption is not linear and used to be much higher in the past. But at any rate, all it says about the age of the dolmen itself is that it was at least that. Pretending that dolmens or tombs has that advantage for academia that it enables them to make the age of the alleged tomb coincide with the age of the remains incidentally found in them. Because as opposed to rocks, human remains can be carbon dated. In passing, many years declared by them to be part of the uranium alignments have been spotted under six meters of seawater off the coast of Brittany as early as 1904 by an archaeologist by the name of Baudouin. As to where the trails thus signaled led, Georges Genin got it wrong. Even though he wasn't that far from the truth, he was off by just a few kilometers actually. Having read that the coasts of Europe had been raided for minerals by the Phoenicians and whatnot, he assumed that the megalith roots led to some uh, lead and pewter quarries, some uh, of them still in operation at Dem's time, that had been found to have been searched in the Dem past. And so he looked no further. It took the perspicacity of a crime novelist to find out that the roots actually kept going. Although the truth was lying in plain sight, it took an ability to think out of the box to admit it, because as compelling and plain as the evidence is, the truth it revealed would have seemed implausible to most. This reminds us that plausibility is no yardstick as to adjudicate the veracity of a theory. We should only be led by facts and logic, just like uranium seekers were led by megalith looming in the distance. Of course, that uranium mining could be contemporaneous of the erection of many years and the construction of dolmens is hard to swallow. But if incontrovertible evidence says you need to swallow it, then you should at least feel free to. But of course, surrendering to logic requires confidence in one's ability to think for oneself, which those designated to think on your behalf try their best to take away. And of the parenthesis. So let's see what the sign by the Menier Trail says. So apparently there used to be a dolmen here. Let's check it out. Yeah, so it looks like the top stone is missing. Or maybe it's one of the slabs that was propped on the other on one side and on a dry stone wall on the other. Or it was smashed into smithereens and that's what the rubble in between is. So there indeed used to be a dolmen by the trail that I hypothesized leads to the uranium mine. What's more intriguing is that the old road looks like it was uh, paved with flagstones back in the day. It could be uh, a Roman via, but the dolmen is embedded in it. So the stone pavement seems contemporaneous with the dolmen. Also, a pile of flat stones runs along the dirt road like they were bulldozed aside. But it's not unlikely that back in the day, the uh, entire road was paved and that the rest of it is lying under a layer of uh, earth. Dam has retraced any number of uh, itineraries signaled by many ears, comprising dolmens a day's walk distance from one another, all leading up to uranium quarries. A staggering number of them. And he himself was uh, uh, abashed by the map of uranium so perfectly overlapping the many grid. Dem points out that when the uranium loads were discovered, rediscovered uh, would be more accurate, traces of ancient quarrying were visible at some of them, just as had been the case uh, for pewter and lead mines. Brad Steiger, in his 1978 book, Worlds Before Around, published just one year after Dems, also mentions this anomaly, which, as mind-boggling as it may sound, makes perfect sense. Why go through the hassle of aligning erected megalith over hundreds of miles if you have no vested interest in the, in the ore itself? Actually, it had to be of tremendous importance to uh, whoever created those routes. And since there is no record of the Phoenicians 
running uh, nuclear plants, it looks like someone else has to be credited for uh, making use of it in ancient times. In passing, no one had ever heard of uranium before the metal was uh, discovered in 1789 by the German chemist Martin Heinrich Klaproth. Then, of course, Dan's theory does not account for all megalith concentrations throughout the world. Now, to apply some context to his discovery, it's essential to bear in mind that in the 70s, uh, when he researched this topic, many uranium deposits were yet to be discovered, like is the case here at uh, Les Bondons, where the quarry was in operation from 1981 to 1989. Also, he limited his fieldwork to France, whereas his investigation of foreign alignments was based on maps and, uh, and second-hand information. But he was convinced that he held the key to the megalith mystery, and he was confident that it would unlock the explanation behind any alignment uncovered in the past and future. Today, as more uranium mines have emerged, we can do some uh, retrospective uh, fact-checking as much as I uh, as I hate the word. Since the time he ran his investigation, any number of uranium mines have cropped up and the best part of the remaining Britain megalith have been signaled on Google Earth by local enthusiasts. In the lights of those innovations, Dem's indications appear somewhat outdated. So much so that I felt the need to undertake the arduous task of gathering all those locations into a single map with the intent to demonstrate the megalith uranium correlation. Only to find that the uranium rich areas were the only ones in Brittany to be devoid of megalith, which struck me as highly suspicious. Then I became of the land consolidation effort that took place in the wake of the Marshall Plan and entailed the ruthless massive destruction of standing stones, dolmens, cairns and tumuli in central Brittany. Incidentally or not, the endeavor coincided with the inception of the uranium prospection campaign in the early 50s. I eventually came upon two maps in a book by Fernand Niel, Connaissance des Megalites, Megalith Knowledge, page 70 and 72, based upon an 1880 inventory by the Commission des Monuments Megalithiques. These show the presence of uh, megalith in the now void area to have then been just as high, if not higher, than along the coastline, and they show particularly dense clusters around the uranium mines. So were they removed to preclude embarrassing parallels? A small number of isolated men ears, though, remain in the area which probably escaped the destroyer's scrutiny. Among them are the Botua Meniers, a pair of standing stones situated at a few meters distance from each other, their alignment pointing at an unnaturally geometrically shaped pond. Three stones embedded in the ground, each on one side of the flooded former quarry, form an arrowhead with the alignment strongly suggesting an indication as to where to start digging. The ore mined here may have been uranium as well as pewter or lead, at any rate, the function of many years as road signs leading up to quarries is borne out here. American watchers will wonder if Dems posit applies to the U.S. Well, just have a look at the map of the Montana Megalith, for instance. Right in the middle of it, in the Boulder Basin area, four former uranium mines can be found. In fact, uranium is everywhere from one end of the alignment to the other. In Carbonaceous rocks in the Townsend and Helena valleys, according to the Geological Survey Bulletin, in nine deposits spotted west of Clancy at the occasion of the 1951 Geological Survey by the U.S. Department of Interior. Dam doesn't drill too deep into the subject of Karnak, and for a reason. This huge concentration of 2,935 megalith can hardly be explained at this point by the road sign theory. But he nevertheless mentions that many dolmen alignments have a tendency to originate by the ocean shores. It's a 30-minute walk uh, from the closest shore to the Karnak site. Moreover, Dem does point out that some of the Brittany uranium routes do point toward Karnak and would likely lead there if it wasn't for the hiatus of missing rocks. 
So maybe it would be worthwhile boring into the relation between Karnak and the uranium trails. Another major concentration, if anything in size near that of Karnak, is the here Cham des Bondons, and the link to the nearby now derelict uranium mine is doubtless. So could major concentrations have been no more and no less than crossroads or departing points? On the other hand, whereas the evidence leaves little doubt as to many years being road signs, do they all point to uranium quarries? The outstretched vertical snakes with their heads on top adorning the Valle Fuzairos red meniers are clear indications of a special location. In Piemonte, Italy, at the top of a huge pyramidal complex, I happened upon the remains of a stone, actually the top fragment of a menhir, right next to the Christian cross that uh, superseded it, that had the head of a snake etched in it, which used to point upward. In his book titled The Giza Power Plant, Chris Dunn points out that, quote, the wall carvings at Dandera in the lower crypt in the Temple of Hathor contains an image that looks similar to a crook's tube. Unquote. In Worlds Before Our Own, Brad Steiger quotes Joey Joshman's analysis of the carvings. Quote, when the tube is in operation, the ray originates where the cathode electrical wire enters to the opposite end. In the temple picture, the electron beam is represented as an outstretched serpent. The tail of the serpent begins where a cable from the energy box enters the tube and the serpent's head touches the opposite end. In Egyptian art, the serpent was the symbol of divine energy." Unquote. So to me, those manners used to indicate the location of the magnetic field induced by the pyramidal shaped hill they were set on top of and that I was able to retrace time and again using a tri-field magnetometer. The very earliest accounts of the use of standing stones are found in the Bible, and if you believe the ancient alien proponents' theory, they used to be set as reminders of paleo contact. At any rate, they were, for the most part, versatile place markers. Roaming the Les Bondons area in search of evidence of the standing stone alignments uranium mines connection, I noticed that three parallel contiguous ridges of matching heights were spiked with meniers merely describable from the bottom of the in-between canyons. Both of the latter bear the hallmarks of surface mining. They measure roughly 100 meters in depth, while their breadth vary within the 500 meters to 1 kilometer bracket, with respective length of 900 meters, 1.5 kilometers, and 2.5 kilometers. Mounds that, with regards to their volumes and situations uh, relative to the said canyon, could very well be the product of excavations, can be spotted near the mouth. A boots on the ground tour of the ridges confirmed that the standing stones indeed line the brims of the canyons as to stake the boundaries of the excavation endeavor. A literal uh, 36,000 foot view of the Bondon area reveals its anomalous conformation as compared to its surroundings. Now there's obviously more to megalith than just place marking, and John Burke's approach reveals a way more sophisticated, though just as utilitarian, use of megalith across Europe and America, which perfectly fits in the spots Georges Lain and Dem have left vacant in the puzzle, like in the case of Karnak, for instance. But I'll touch on that in a future settlement. Dem points out that dolmens served both as shelters and beacons. He shows that the allegation that the entrance to dolmens always faces the rising sun is a myth. And I was able to confirm this based on my own observations. Out of six dolmens I visited lately, only one of them was facing east. Julie Ryder makes the argument that many years openings were often oriented as to point toward pyramidal mounds situated in the, in the distance, which assertion is corroborated by observations previously made by Eastern European uh, researchers. So it really looks like megaliths were used to indicate various types of point of interest, and the fact that those all have to do with radiations of some kind seem to point to a civilization relying on that 
phenomenon in a vast array of applications. Dam's research is obviously incomplete and needs to be taken up by contemporary investigators. He himself calls for it in, in the book. The tantalizing question we need to answer is, who were they who relied on uranium ore as an energy source tens of thousands if not millions of years back? According to a compelling source I came across, which I will certainly cover at some point, there is evidence around the world that not just uranium, but a vast array of uh, minerals were mined to a huge scale everywhere on Earth in the dim past. And you wouldn't believe how much of the, of the landscape could actually <coughs> be the result of uh, gargantuan mining and uh, energy producing activity. Whoever ran those facilities possessed monstrous machinery and had a need for humongous amounts of ore. Way more it seems that the contemporary dwellers of Earth will ever need. As to the uranium root civilization, Dem contends that they must be of extraterrestrial origin. He argues that if many alignments and their associated uranium deposits can be found scattered around the world in isolation from uh, Argentina to uh, Korea and whatnot, no in between concentration being present to suggest cultural propagation, the latter approach must be dismissed. So who, Dem asks, possessed a worldwide scope and was able to set up those routes uh, wherever they needed them around the globe, if not off-world types. Well, if our civilization happened to be eradicated by a cataclysm of some kind, the remains of it would be found scattered across the planet in the same way. So there's no doubt in my mind that an advanced worldwide civilization, whether it was of extraterrestrial origin or not, built those roads and operated the uranium mines. Moreover, would someone who was able to travel from a distant planet have needed to walk the distance, even if they employed earthlings to perform the extraction work, as the existence of camps uh, in the vicinity of uh, the uh, uranium fields uh, and many years showing maps of them suggests, uh, couldn't they have flown them in? Yet they traveled by boat and walked. The very discrepancy between the apparent lack of sophisticated means of transportation and orientation and the advanced knowledge that led to uh, the use of uranium uh, can only be explained by a situation such as would result from a cataclysm and the subsequent destructions of infrastructure which would compel the survivors to, to, to start again from scratch. <clears throat> knowledge being all that remained of uh, destroyed technologies. So, of course, the uranium trails seemingly emerging from the oceans and starting from uh, coves and bays where birthing uh, would have been easiest, Atlantis and Lemuria inevitably come to mind. Brittany is uh, bordered on one side by the Atlantic and on the other by the Channel. And interestingly enough, None of the uranium routes are found to depart from the channel side. History books paint the veneer of ancient time as being quote unquote the theologic age with early civilizations spending most of their time erecting religious monuments and uh, monumental tombs and the rest of it sacrificing one another let alone the fact that uh, zero mummies were ever found in pyramids and that very little, almost no human remains were found in dolmens and arranged or rather disarranged in such a way as to suggest that they were just dumped there. Dam underscores that the Paris catacombs themselves uh, were originally part of the uh, plaster of Paris uh, gypsum quarries and that part of it uh, was repurposed into an ossuary. The religious funerary ritualistic pretext is very convenient to flush out just about any discovery that doesn't fit in the official picture. 
and that many alignments were part of a utilitarian mundane undertaking just shatters that vision of the past altogether. As alternative research makes headway, it's getting increasingly obvious that a technologically advanced civilization preceded ours on Earth, and just like us, their main preoccupation was energy production. From there on, it makes perfect sense that they also likely made consumer goods, did business, and so on and so forth. In a future episode, I will cover several geoglyphs that I discovered in southern France, one of which shows a little dog designed in a cute and comical fashion that is redolent of, yes, advertising. So the uranium mine is situated down there, right in the direction that uh, those uh, manners are indicating. It's, it's just down there. It's, uh, it's very close. So this is it, the former uranium mine. That's where it used to be. So there is nothing left of it except the field, but it was in operation from uh, 81 to 89. And right here is the last many of the alignment. And there are two more huge ones on the slope commanding the, uh, the site. So it looks like uh, Dan's theory is... Uh, is proven once again.